you are about to enter into a new world of knowledge, curiosities, and high strangeness. This is a podcast of Straight Up Strange Productions. You're listening to Mysteries and Monsters. I'm your host, Paul Bestel. Over the last few years, it seems people were having strange and terrifying experiences in the woods, moors and forests of East and North Yorkshire. Incredibly, witnesses are describing a large bipedal canid creature, and the ramifications of these encounters seem to stay with them for months, even years afterwards. In his upcoming new documentary, our good friend Paul Sinclair returns to discuss some of the encounters witnesses and locations that are featured in the film, and we ponder just what could be happening. But before we get to that conversation, don't forget you can support Mysteries and Monsters by signing up at patreon.com slash mysteriesandmonsters. $4 a month gets you ad-free episodes, guaranteed early releases, bonus content, competitions and more. You can also click the link in the show notes as always. A big thank you to everybody who continues to support the show through Patreon, and especially to my latest, Heather. Thank you very much. And I'd also like to say thank you to Charlotte for her lovely donation, which she made via PayPal at mysteriesandmonsters at gmail.com. Mysteries and Monsters is also across all social media platforms, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Mastodon, and please subscribe to the Mysteries and Monsters channel on YouTube. You can also visit mysteriesandmonsters.com for news, episodes, and merchandise. Thank you as always to Dean Bestall for his marvellous artwork. The show is produced by Brennan Storr of the Ghost Story Guys, and Mysteries and Monsters is delighted to be a part of the Straight Up Strange Network. Now, let's join Paul Sinclair as we discuss these series of strange encounters in the Wolflands. My guest today is one of the busiest and most diligent researchers out there, with five books and a fabulous live stream show and a soon to be released documentary entitled Wolflands can only mean one person joins me, and that's Paul Sinclair. His no nonsense honest approach has seen him garner follows of his work from all around the world, and I am delighted to have gotten to know him over these last four years. Making his fifth appearance on Mysteries and Monsters. Welcome, Paul. Thank you very much, Paul. Absolute pleasure. And uh, like you said, don't seem like five appearances, mate, does it? But uh, it doesn't. They're all good. <laughs> Absolutely. It's one of those things as well, obviously, because we still we're in touch regularly, and obviously I watch you on, when you do your live streams and stuff. But obviously, the first first time we've had a proper chat on your, you coming on my show for uh, eighteen months, buddy. Really? Is, is that long? Is it? Well, uh, a bit long overdue then, Paul, because. Uh, what you do is great. You get some great guests on, and uh, I'm I'm just kind of honoured to be part of uh, your show. Really good, thank you. No, oh, you're very, very welcome. Very welcome. And as I touched on in in the introduction, Paul, obviously the, the last sort of eighteen months has really seen you focusing on on bringing this new documentary together. But um, for anybody that's followed your work, it, it's one of those things that we're all anticipating what this is going to be. But I think this is something that's not just appeared on your radar. I mean, the documentary Wolflands is obviously dealing with some extremely strange and unusual experiences that people have been reporting to you for, for several years, isn't it? That's correct. I'm probably going back further than that, Paul. And uh, I should imagine people who listen to any podcast that I talk on, they're probably thinking, good God, when's he going to finish this documentary? And I don't blame you listeners, honestly, but uh, please understand that there's just been myself and Les Drake doing this. I've written it, narrated it, and we, we've sourced the witnesses who, who are absolutely first class, and we treat them really good, and they've been, they've, you know, they've reciprocated that back to us with with their accounts, and it's it's just been it's just been a long process. I mean, bearing in mind that I, I, I weren't, I didn't even invest any time in writing books prior to. 2016 mm. you know I've, I've spent a lifetime as i keep saying knocking nails in wood yeah so i'm, I'm jumping into something with wolflands that that's totally alien uh pardon the pun to what <laughs> uh yeah well you know to what i'm used to doing and i didn't realize but 
I hope it's going to be worth it. I, my gut feeling is, and I've watched a lot of documentaries, in, in, including some that we, you, people pay to download, and I'm not going to badmouth anybody's work because, you know, they're all good. But I, it's on par. It's it's really, I'm really sort of thrilled to, to have now sat back and said, we've finished Wolflands. The filming is done. It's been, it's in a music studio now, having music added to it. And we're very lucky, Paul, because... My daughter's got a recording studio, and mm -hmm. she's her and her husband Nick have teamed up with Mick Park and Nick Britton, and between them, they're they're working on the music. And uh, I'm lucky that Mick Park's took an interest because of people that don't know, look up his name and look up uh, you know, sort of dance music, 1990s, early 2000s, and he's gone on to, into he's gone on to be sort of even better things now working with acts like you two yeah. ruby turner you know it's, it's so what basically what i'm saying people i know is this is a podcast about unexplained phenomena so i'm not going to drone on too long about that but we, we're lucky we've been very lucky with people that we've got helping us it's not just paul sinclair and there's a great team of people helping us even though it's just me and les doing bulk at work yeah so the thing about all this is that obviously most people will know you predominantly for everything you've done in regards to the Truth Proof books and, and your own personal encounters that you covered in, in the night, people, Paul. But obviously, with you exploring and investigating a, a wide range of strange phenomena in that area, when was the first time someone kind of came forward to you explaining something? Because obviously, I remember hearing you several years ago, I think the first time I heard you on Howard Hughes, and one of the couple of interviews there, you were talking about that guy that was camping, and there was a strange incident with some creature trying to get in his tent. So, how long ago is it since somebody kind of pointed out that there were more more than just the strange anomalies that we are aware of that you research in general, Paul? Well, if, if, we, if we just stuck with the, the cryptid-type sightings, I mean, I didn't really have any interest in them at all until writing the first book. And then it was only a mild interest because, you know, local papers put a few out, little articles in saying, oh, I'm writing a book, you know, local budding author kind of thing, and which were great, and I appreciate them doing it. And I received a few reports of this thing from Flixton, the Flixton werewolf. And uh, from there it snowballed, Paul, and now I can't, I can't actually keep up with it. Uh, I'm up at 5 a.m., and I'm sure there's a lot of other people doing the same. And I'm up at 5 a.m. just answering emails and, and messages and and people who are genuinely looking for help as well. And I don't know if I can if I can help people. I'm, I don't think I'm a counsellor, but uh, you know when but people are asking me my views on experiences they've had, and it all eats into your time. And I like to give people my time. I've just been asked to write forward for for two books, mm. and I, I would. I was writing a reply to to what the lady just before I came on air, and another guy, I, he knew I was going to do it. But I'll struggle to read books. I'll have to do, yep. but it's just it's time. Yeah. It's just time. And that didn't answer your question, Paul, did it? I, I realised that. But, uh, no, the, the, the cryptid phenomena, it's snowballed. But one thing one thing that's become apparent, I think, in, to me anyway, in the last two to three years, is the fact that all of this phenomena is linked. Mm. And uh, even if it's just linked by location, because everything seems to occur in these hotspots, mm. you know, and, and I dare say that if somebody's had a cryptid sighting or somebody's had a UFO sighting, if you dig deep enough, I'm not saying we've just got to create something just to prove Paul's theory, but if you dig deep enough, you'll probably find that there's a lot of unexplained phenomena occurred in and around, you know, where these things are happening. Uh, I, I spoke on a podcast a few days ago about the Hunmanby incident mm. and and you know obviously it, it, it sort of climaxed is the word with the, the landed flying saucer mm. and the beings however three years prior prior to that seven uh, I think it was 96 97 98 it took place they were experiencing all sorts of unexplained phenomena, mm. multi-phenomena, and, and it started almost amoeba-ish. It started with the subtlest of things, uh, things flying through the air, if that's subtle, you yeah. know, steel washers, and, and, and building up over that three-year period. And even cryptid sighting, as, as one of the witnesses was locking the gates up of the industrial unit one night, and he, he sort of, he didn't, I don't think he felt anything. It was just pitch dark. 
absolutely blackness in back in 1998 at Hummanby on that industrial unit. And he, when he turned around after locking the gate, there's this huge figure, seven to eight foot tall, stood in front of him, huge black shoulder, uh, black figure with huge shoulders and, and an head that kind of sat on top of its shoulders with no neck. Mm. And so so everything, everything seems linked. And there's so many things that I just kind of throw about in my head, thinking, I mean, is this just one intelligence that is presented as many things? Or, or is it that the, the, the land, the surrounding area is somehow allowing these things to come through? So you've, you've got a multitude of unexplained, different types of unexplained pr- phenomena presenting. Yeah. Even, uh, which, which doesn't throw away from the fact that I've just said they're all connected because they are connected by location, mm. but they might not even be aware of each other. Yeah. It's, it's multifaceted. It's really difficult to get your head around what's going on because to the UFO researcher, anybody visit, visiting Bempton, Speeton, or all the way along that coastline, it's a UFO researcher's dream mm. because I mean, you've visited there, Paul, yeah. and, uh, and, you know, I think we spent a, a good while up there and nothing happened, and that's the, usually the case. Yeah. But as you know, like I always say, you, you, you do have a higher probability of seeing something there, I would think, than most places in the United Kingdom. Yeah. And, but it's not just, it's not just the UFOs. It's, uh, you know, it's because solid structured craft have been seen there. You've got the light form phenomena. There's even got ghosts. Yeah. You know, the, the fishermen talk of the ghost of big railings. And then you, you know, you've, you've got disjointed voices, radio chatter and things that occur. So is it all one phenomena? Is it the, the, the fact that the area is, has, has got some kind of special properties? I don't mean geological. I mean, just something that science doesn't understand that's allowing this to come through. Paul, I really don't know, mm. but uh, it's there. And yeah. I, I, the cryptids, Wolflands, did I ever think I would be interested in such a thing? I could tell you now, no. <laughs> yes. And uh, I, re- I really didn't, but it's got me. It's, it's, I'm, I'm as fascinated with this as any part of the subject because, and I don't mean, oh, we've got the witnesses and our witnesses are better than anybody, but they're, yeah. they're good witnesses. And, uh, you know, Sometimes, as a researcher, you, you know you 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 don't always sit on fence. I've got to jump off fence and put hand on heart and say I believe what I'm being told with these people. And I've no no fear in saying that. Uh, and you know we've we've had other people who've contributed and and helped us, and it's not been used. We yeah. you know we, we've realised that it's a little you know it's a little bit suspect, should we say, mm. some information. I think. One of the things that I've always been impressed with about you, Paul, is that you don't, like like you mentioned when I came to see it, it would have been very easy to perform, you know, and say, oh, this is happening and that's this and that. But you and Bob took us through everything, showed us all your equipment, pointed all the things out that people use as explanations and telling us everything. I mean, I thought I saw something and you put me in my place. <laughs> Saying, oh, no, it's not, not what you think it is, Paul. So that for me, Paul, it's refreshing that you've always had this, as I said on the intro, no nonsense approach to it. It would be very easy to claim that this is happening all the time. But as you say, the more the more you go, then fair enough, you're going to have more chance of seeing something. But more often than not, nothing happens. Yeah, do you know, Paul, it, it'd be so easy, and I'm not about this, people, but it'd be so easy to fake something. Yeah. And I mean easy, because we've spent so many years up there. You know when the rock anglers go and fish off these three to 400-foot sheer rock faces? Well, if the, with their fishing, so let's say, quarter of a mile up the coast from us, and they put their torches onto the sea. You don't see a beam. You see a light on the sea. You see a light on the surface of the sea. So I, and I said to Bob Brown the other day, I said, put psionics camera on it, and I can see it. Yeah. So, and you could easily fool somebody, and I bet you this kind of thing happens. You know when you people go around with the EMF meters? Yeah. And they say, look at meter, it's going mad, it's going crazy. And... Uh, We've what we do if we take the, uh, the the meters up there is first thing we do is that either we don't take phones or we put us phones well away. From, yeah. You know, we'll leave it on one that stands and walk somewhere mm. because obviously if you if you've got an, an electrical device and you want to just as you just turn and you've got that in your pocket, this thing is going to go mad. And to some and and you, you you can pass things off as look at this, this is happening. We've asked it a question and this is happening and. 
you know, come on, people. Let, we, we know the subject and we know what we're looking into is real, even if we've only got sparse proof. But let's not cheat, are we? To, <laughs> do you know what I mean? I mean, these aren't tricks of the trade, people. These are just things that we've picked up on while we've been doing it. So I took some uh, footage years ago. These are the ones, kind of things that I would say kind of annoy me, people who don't look into things very well. And we put it onto the yeah. internet, onto YouTube. And it was an orange, let me correct, correct myself, it was an orange light at the back of the RAF base. Yeah. And it was moving rapidly, it went, you know, from the, from the cliff all the way up. And when I put it on, I didn't put it on professing it to be anything. I just said, look, we've filled this unusual light. Yeah. And I, I immediately jumped on by some armchair critic who was telling me, telling everyone, including me, that I've just filmed the lighthouse and I'm trying to fool people. Hmm. If he'd have come to the area, he would have realised the lighthouse was behind me. Yes. I, did, I didn't even bother trying to defend myself, but you could see the contour of the buildings and everything. I was stood behind the lighthouse. Hmm. But you, you will always get that. You, you know, you always get people, who, 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 for want of a better word, know better than you, even though they've not been on, we'll call it ground zero. Yeah. Everybody's got an answer, haven't they? Yeah. You know, it's <clears throat> it's easy to do that. It is. It is. I mean, it's strange as well, Paul, because obviously I, know, I knew the area anyway, even before we'd spoken, because obviously I'd yeah. been out there a few times playing golf mostly. So I knew really? exactly where this lighthouse was because I've played golf around there. So yeah, yeah. when I heard explanations like that, I knew the area enough to know that I knew what it couldn't be as well. So to to now have gotten to know you and been out there for, for other reasons than golf <laughs> is, yeah. is quite strange, Paul, because I never thought I'd I'd be doing what I'm doing. You know, like you, you said, you know, all them years ago when we both grew up other side of Barnsley from each other. Yeah. Here we are 40, 50 years down the line. I don't think either of us would have imagined why we'd, we'd be having this conversation at any point at that, you know, when we were lads growing up. It's, so it's it's amazing how things can sometimes just take you in a direction you would never imagine. And, and once again, this is where we've got with Wolflands because you started looking into strange lights and whatever and then it's just become this multi-tentacled phenomena that seems to tick in all the boxes across a wide range of things going on that's correct you know we uh, we have we've been on with wolflands three years it's a long time but uh, what we picked up on i didn't just want to make a documentary about cryptids because like we've just touched on i realized that there's a lot of other things occurring around the time of the sightings. I mean, one of the reports we've got in, in Wolflands is we've got Lee Hayward talking about seeing a huge sphere of light on the clifftops whilst with me. Lee's a really credible witness, and uh, I like to think I'm an art decent witness because I was stood with him at the time. And it was in the field w that we were looking onto and the hill was in the background, and we'll touch on that hill in a in a few minutes, if you want, Paul, because we actually filmed something there uh, on February the 7th, uh, which was last Tuesday. Yeah. So me and Lee saw that on uh, 14th of November 2019. Yeah. And it was spectacular. I'd, I'd, I'd never thought I'd see one of these spheres of lights so close. It was huge. In Lee's words, the influence the light was giving was the size of a Volkswagen Beetle. It was huge. Yeah. And so, but what we didn't know, and uh, at, at the time, what we what we couldn't have known was that on the 12th of November, there was a cryptid sighting. And we found out about that, myself and Bob Brown, what, during COVID, we, we went, visited a farm because there were nobody allowed to go anywhere on mass kind of thing. And we parked up at this farm and walked across the fields and a, guy met us yeah uh sorry a guy passed us walking his dog and uh he thought we were bird spotting uh you know because it's a seabird colony but it was getting dark and we never yeah. told him and subsequently when he arrived back because it's dark by then he realized we weren't so we told him what we were doing trying to capture footage of these strange lights and bob ended up asking him if he'd seen anything unusual they used the staple expl explanation of the big cats everybody seems to accept that they could be here and then he went and told us this story about seeing something that was akin to a werewolf on the cliff tops at Speeton, which would have been about a mile down the coast from where we were sat as we spoke to him. And he said it was the full moon in November 2019. So as soon as I got home, I started, I Googled it to get the date. And that was the 12th of November, two days before myself and Lee saw this huge sphere of light. Hmm. So 
I am not saying that, I don't know, the spheres of light are responsible for the the, the creature sighting, yeah. but something within the makeup of, of the land even, the, the, you know, there's the connection perhaps. Yeah. Or I could be wrong. I could, you know, you, there'll be other people that say, oh, no, no, the spheres of light are a definite signal that these things are around. Mm -hmm. Because I think uh, you get a lot of cryptid uh, researchers will tell you that there's light phenomena seen uh, with, with Bigfoot sightings and things like that, you know, so maybe th maybe there is a lot of truth in it, mm. and uh, and there's a lot of Bigfoot researchers who the ones who want to believe that it's flesh and blood, something that's sort of living and breathing and forging some kind of uh, I don't know mystical existence undetected out there in the vast wildernesses of, of Alaska and places, which is possible. Mm. They might also witness light form phenomena, but it doesn't fit their narrative, so they're not saying anything. Yeah. And I know this to be true, Paul, and I yeah. know this has this has been happening, and uh, that's that's such a shame. You know, you get the nuts and bolts UFO guys who won't touch the light forms or won't touch the cryptid type of subjects, even if they witness it or they get a witness telling them yeah. that this happened or that happened. It doesn't fit their narrative. Yeah. It's got to be multi. In my opinion, Paul, this is multi phenomena research. Absolutely. Well, it would be a crying shame, really, Paul, because as you say, I'm well aware of certain researchers over the years and certain cases where there have been more than just the phenomena that they're looking into happening and they've ignored it they've just not yeah. they've just not thought oh, well I'm not really interested in that so I'm not really bothered and i think when we've spoken before and when you when you read the books we've got strange things being seen in the sky we've got strange encounters we've got unusual incidents we've got disappearances you've got big cat sightings you've got everything that's led towards wolflands you've got Weird noises, poltergeists, hauntings, strange things going on, the weird things that were in your house when you moved in, all these spiritualism letters that were there. That's you know? yeah. So if you'd have just been looking after your nuts and bolts UFOs, Paul, there would be this whole body of evidence that nobody, because nobody else has picked the baton up and run with this, Paul. It's it, You've uncovered a lot of these. I know some researchers have done some bits in the past, but obviously a lot of this... You've brought to the fore because of your interest in everything rather than just focusing on one thing. And for that, it's obviously better for both yourself and us when we're following what you're going on with. It, it, I think so. And, and thanks for highlighting that, Paul. I appreciate it because, uh, you know, I, I have kind of noted that other people are picking up on the fact that, you know, I think they like the coin, the term in. How I've called it the, the multi phenomena research. I've noted other people are, are coming out with it now, and rightly so. It's good because uh, that's what it is. You know, and I, I don't know whether it's going to lead us to any any more kind of enlightenment on exactly what's happening, but we can't deny it, it, it anyway, regardless of whether we understand it or not. You know, Paul, on the yep. uh, on the seventh of February. Uh, I was up there with Bob Brown and a friend of ours called Peter. Yep. Uh, I'll not say Peter's second name. He likes to just keep a, a little bit under the radar. Mm. But uh, he lives in Bempton. That's probably the reason. And not not that there's anything wrong with Pete. It's, what I'm meaning is like he just probably just doesn't want people to realize uh, to know he's looking into this. Yeah. We went up, we were stood on one of the bird stands. We didn't venture too far away because Bob's just had a knee operation and he's, he's in a bit of pain, struggling to walk. So... We're up there, and it was quarter to seven. Bob's a better man than me. He always notes the time of these things. Uh, so I'm looking inland towards this hill, the same hill where in 2019, on November the 14th, myself and Lee saw this huge sphere. And I can see what I believe is a little orange bubble on top of the hill. And the, the sky, I can see a bit of a glow. So I brought it to Pete and Bob's attention, and uh, it kind of went out. So they're looking, and I, I don't mean they didn't believe me, but there was nothing to see. And I said, just stay with it. I said, I've just seen – I'm sure I've just seen some of the skies glowing. And they never said anything, and I don't know how long we waited, no more than a few minutes. And suddenly, a huge orange globe just lifted up. Stayed for a second and then went straight back down, mm. and you could see the you could see the the glow. So in, my mistake was not putting the camera on when I alerted them to what I thought I'd seen. You know, I stood there observing with them, so I flipped the camera on straight away yeah. after that. 
And sure enough, it did it again. We got it on film. It didn't rise as high into the sky this time. Mm. What it was, I don't know. But here's the thing. It was February the 7th. February the 7th, 2020. So you can't make this stuff up, people, because it's well documented. Mm. Uh, but, you know, I've already said it. Bob Brown and my daughter Gemma, who was staying with us for a few weeks well, in, before she moved into a new property, mm. they saw a square of white light on that hillside. 2020, February the 7th. Is it just coincidence? Uh, that night when she got home, because we moved over into the 8th, because she stayed up and watched TV, and she said, when we got up the next morning, she said, I nearly come and woke you up, Dad. I said, why? She said, there was a noise when I was watching TV. And she said, and I thought it was thunder, and I turned the TV down, and then I realised there's something right at the back of me growling. She said, and it was in my insides, the, it was reverberating the, in my insides. I was terrified. Mm. And now, there's a brick wall at the back of us, Paul. And yeah. There's a passage, passage behind that. And that's our passage, and there's a passage, there's, there's the, another brick wall, and then an outside passage. Yeah. There's a flat above, and the lady, who, it was unoccupied because she'd moved out, they're our flats, so I, I know that for sure, and Bob's in the top flat. So, what was it? Uh, did, did, did she bring some attachment back with her? You know, they talk about the hitchhiker effect. Yeah. I, I don't know, but what I find more significant is that we've got a, a repeat date, the yeah. 7th of February. And then if we go back to 2019... And I think it was the 7th of February then that the military guys encountered the cryptid yeah. on the cliff tops. Mm. You know, so it, I just, I think there's a little bit more than coincidence. I know and there'll be some researchers to be covered in that date and thinking, well, we don't tell anybody because other people might latch onto it and go up there and they might film something. Well, I'm not bothered because it's for the good of yeah. what we're doing. And if, if people want to go up there, respect the land, res respect private land but go up there and observe february the 7th next year please do because uh all, 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 all around that date 6th 7th and 8th i think to, i think we've got a little bit more than coincidence when you've got 2019 2020 and now we've got 2023 uh and, and our sighting which i've got on film yeah but, kind of tells you there's something happening absolutely and obviously i'm fortunate enough for you to share that image with me but that is a very very bright light bright orange because you can see how bright it is because it's it's reflecting up into the sky that's correct and uh, i took some more stills of the object as it lifted or whatever it was we're calling it an object as though i'm i'm certain what it was it could be some uh, earth type energy i really don't know but uh, i've took some more frame captures of the actual footage and i've put them onto the uh, Truth Proof website. Yeah. Uh, oh, the Truth Proof page and the website, truthproof.uk. And you can see how bright it is. And it it is off the ground. If you zoom in on the picture, you'll see the sky between the object or whatever it is and the land. Yeah. So interesting. You know, absolutely fascinating for me. But And I'm off up there tonight. Yeah. So, so uh, we'll, we'll try another instalment of nothingness because, you know, <laughs> well... <laughs> yeah, it's, that's what it's like, mate. I'm, I've yeah. been up there best part of at least six months with nothing happening. Yep. You know, if people have rang me and told me that they've observed things, but I've not been there when they've observed them. Mm. I've seen the lights over the sea twice, and they literally just opened up, as in came from nothing, sort of emerged and then imploded. Yeah. Uh, and that's it. Mm. That's that's basically what's been happening. It's very quiet. Yeah. But uh, you just know it's got the potential to uh, produce something spectacular, and it does from time to time. Yeah, well, exactly. I know when I was speaking to you last week about it, Paul, you, you said to me, right, this has happened. Showed me. It. I'm going back up there tonight, and obviously nothing happened the second night. No, no, you've got, you've got to, you've got to do it, Paul. Uh, and, and and it's almost like a a bug because I went to, I got up at uh, five o'clock Sunday morning. Well, yesterday morning, and uh, I came into this little office. Now I had, I had a look at a few emails and what have you, and I thought I'm going back up there. So I had myself a drink of tea and a couple of biscuits to be honest because i'm so lazy mary does all cooking for me <laughs> so uh, and well i don't mind admitting it you know yeah. uh, and and i jumped in car and i went back up and i came back off off cliffs again then at uh, 
about half eight, nine o'clock, but I wanted to be there before first light, mm. uh, you, you know, and uh, absolutely nothing, yep. you know, absolutely nothing. And I think when I'm, when I'm going, I'm, you only need one little taste of, of the phenomena, or I do, and I'm sure that a lot of people listening to this who are, who are actively looking for it and trying to engage with something, I know the, there's the term, be careful what you wish for, yeah. but you only need one little taste of it to kind of feed that, desire to keep going hmm. but it's quite i find it quite a, a buzz to be honest yeah. knowing the anticipation of knowing that something that you absolutely that's off the scale of normal can be seen and you've got the chance to capture it on film on audio you know and i know you've got researchers who say if you take cameras up you're never going to film it won't perform you're never going to capture them. And, uh, you know, I think they've got a point. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's a lot of the times it's always when we're least expecting it. Yeah. But it won't stop me taking cameras up, people, because if I'm going to capture anything and, and show people about what I'm talking about, I've got to do it. Mm. And, you know, and that's the way it is. Absolutely. And uh, with the greatest respect, there are countless people out there paul that have, have claimed made incredible claims with absolutely no evidence other than what they say so <laughs> over the years you you've caught a multitude of images of all kinds of strange things whereas a lot of people will, will say oh well i've seen this and this happens and and you know i've seen some researchers in australia who claim that they can invite them down and all this yeah. which and and but then when they show the footage, it could be absolutely bloody anything. Whereas I, as I say, because I've been there, I know what the the location and the and the topography of the area are like. I know that there's nothing that this can be mistaken for in the areas that these images are coming from. Because as I said, when you were there, I was amazed at what you could actually see when you were looking through your, some of your equipment, like you were showing me out with the, some kind of building work going out in the in the north sea and some you could see oil rigs and things it was incredible how far you could see paul yeah, yeah well, yeah, well I, that's, I do sort of invest quite a bit of money in equipment to be honest with you yeah and uh I, once again i think you've got to do you know the little psionics cameras they're okay you know i mean I'm, people will have heard me moaning on about them because they don't give a true representation of the color you're looking at however they do allow you to see things in the dark you, you know, so you, you, one one thing offsets another. You know, I've spent a, a lot of money on a thermal camera, and then we've got the Sony 4K camera, which is brilliant, and then the, the, the P900 with the incredible zoom. So everything's kind of got its place, but uh, there's no substitute for your eyes. <laughs> you know, it's, it, it's all – I mean, some people don't want to film things. Yeah. Steve Ashby just came out, a good friend of mine, Steve, he's come out for years and years, and he just he, – He's got cameras, but he'll just sooner observe. And if he sees anything, he'll pick binoculars up and have a look. I'm, I'm just obsessed with trying to catch it on film. But, yeah, but I, I turn a lot of things down. You know, I, I got asked to go on TV this weekend mm. to talk about, I think I told you, to talk about the ghosts of Cannock Chase. Yeah. And I could have done what a lot of researchers do and waffled on about nothing. But I know nothing about the ghosts of Cannock yeah. Chase. So I turned it down, but I could have got myself a load of publicity, but yeah. I didn't. I don't want to just be a phony and talk about something I've no knowledge on. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you know, absolutely. And I think that's always a, a good good way to hold yourself in in whatever field you do, Paul. Because I'm one of those people. If I've not got a passion for something or I don't know much about it, I'm a terrible liar. <laughs> so yeah, I, I can't. You soon I can't get fudge caught it. out. Yeah, you know, you, people soon get caught out. They'd, some, they'd only have to ask me something about what do you think to this in 1998 or, or in 2010, and yeah. mm, I'd just be sort of thinking, God, what am I going to say now? Uh, you know, <laughs> yeah. uh, so so you can't do that, can you, Paul? But uh, no. you know, I've got some I've got some big cat footage which have been sent about three weeks ago, mm. and I put a few stills up. And I, I still don't know what I can do with it. I still don't know, permissions-wise. Mm. The, but there's some people would have gone straight to paper with that and probably got £1,100, £1,200 yeah. just ju just for submitting it. But then I'd be I'd be sort of being disingenuous to people who'd sent it, you know, so yeah. I, I can't do that. So I'm sat on some brilliant footage at the moment, mm. you, you know, so eventually I'd, it'll probably end up going on the internet. Mm. Absolutely. And I know, as we, as we were touching on there, when you're talking about this particular area where we've seen these lights, obviously one of the the strangest encounters, as we mentioned, was these two lads. Now, 
As far as I remember, Paul, they were into wild camping, so they'd just That's gone. Up, they'd just gone up there just for a for a, to go out for the night. These were two Arden lads, you know. These are not gentle wallflowers who are just used to occasionally having a bit of camping. These were lads that were used to the elements, really looking forward to going to the area. When I've heard them speak, and obviously they're in the documentary as well, there's clearly still, as there is with several of the witnesses that I've seen in some of the footage that you've kindly shown on on the truth proof live stream the other week there was a 15 minute segment that you that you shared with everybody to see which was appetite inducing and and really gave me a real taste of how the film's going to be paul so whenever there's two or three of the people in, included in in the clips that i've seen there's still a real resonance of fear when they're talking about their experience regardless of their backgrounds and these are big lads in a couple of yeah. experiences paul this they still seem scared to me absolutely you know i mean the 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 there was three witnesses in Broxa Forest who went wild camping. Like you said, uh, no, no wallflowers. The you know the hardworking guys in the in the late forties to early fifties. We've two of them have gone on camera. The third one won't. So I've just called him, you know, witness C or whatever or number three. Uh, I don't know what. But they ended up in that forest because Jimmy, he, he's a self-appointed leader without being anybody acknowledging it. He used to find the locations where they would go and they'd go on two or three of these camping trips per year, uh, you know, as a break. Middle of nowhere, bit of fishing, uh, you know, maybe take a few beers. I don't know. They said they'd not been drinking that night. and But he'd look for places using Google Earth that are really remote and he ended up up in North Yorkshire at Broxer, and they'd never been. And it's an 800-foot ravine, and as Steve said, he said, you came, we, we, we arrived quite late, and we came down in some places. You have to come down on your backside. It's that steep. And uh, it was getting dark when we set up camp, and unusually, the witness number three because they're not interested in unexplained phenomena, 100% not interested in anything like this. And he started saying they were being watched and he didn't like it and they had to go and we've got to leave. And Steve and Jim said, he said, it was getting dark. It had just took us like best part of an hour and a half to get down this ravine. Yeah. First, walking along a logging road first to get to it yep. and then go down into it. And there's a river running in the bottom, the River Derwent, which incidentally is not far from Flixton, where all the accounts of the Flixton werewolf uh, <laughs> originate, and East Ayton, where there's, there's ancient stories of the bar guest of East Ayton, this huge terrifying hound yeah. that go back into folklore. Mm -hmm. So he said we were trying to keep him calm. And during this process, half an hour past, three quarters of an hour, it's very dark now, uh, he said a huge pair of eyes lit up in the darkness. He said and they were human-shaped eyes, but they were amber and they were huge. It's like he was saying, as big as your fist. He says they were massive. Yeah. He said, and I, Jim's words were, "I'm trying to. I was trying to think of an animal to assign those eyes to." I mean, you'll hear him in Wolfland saying that. He said, "And I couldn't think of anything. It could be." And all the time, witness number three is getting more and more frightened, and they're worried he's going to run into darkness. Yeah. So they're trying to console him, and and a period of time passed, and in the end, Jim stood up. And, st and walked towards it and made some hissing and shooing sounds going, you know, shooing it away, and it disappeared. Mm. They were only about three foot off the ground, these eyes, and he turned back to witness number three and to Steve, and they, they were just looks, he said there was looks of horror, terror on the faces. He says the jaws had dropped. He says, and then I turned around, and this thing stood in the darkness, silhouetted, not by a full moon, people. I think it was just coincidence that we'd got a full moon in 2019 on the 12th, because I don't think there's any correlation to uh, yeah. transformation or anything with these things. And don't, please don't think that that's where I'm going with it. Says, but there was a bit of moonlight, and we could see it defined in moonlight, and it stood there, just looking at us. He says, and they'd never seen anything as big. Steve said you could have fitted two men into it. It was that monstrously big yeah uh, and I, I mean i went back with the surveyor's tape we've been to it several times into forest with these guys mm -hmm. and slept in forest you know overnight with them and uh, you know uh, the, the fear that it induced on steve he said he'd been thinking about it the first time for two weeks and wondering whether to go whether he shouldn't go and uh, he watched them all night 
and they thought that at one point they thought it were growling at them and they realized it was its breathing so we've got something physical there haven't we yeah. if it's if it's if we're able to hear some guttural breathing mm. and there's so many things that surprise you when they're talking and he said if you would have asked me to draw a werewolf i wouldn't have drawn that yeah he said his ears looked ridiculously tall stuck up in air mm. and it turned when it turned because he said it, it, i think he said it turned to the right a few times and then you could see its muzzle yeah he said it were almost wily coyote like it was just yeah. ridiculous so i went back with a surveyor's tape you know they told me where they'd seen it and uh where they'd camped because we camped in exactly the same spot twice mm. and i you know over two weekends and then we've been in since as well we've, we've been in a lot of time since but not with the witnesses yeah and um and measured roughly where they thought it was so where they saw the eyes we just gauged it with jim so we, we know that it could be three inch out it could be it could be taller it could be smaller but it were 87 inches to where they where they could see the eyes the glow <laughs> and i put a, sti- a white sticker on a tree i'd have to stand on an orange crate people because i'm only five foot six but <laughs> <laughs> just but it, but it, it were 86 inches yeah and it were 42 feet away from them yeah and uh, you know those so all right 42 feet might sound like a long way but i think if i were looking at something like that 42 feet away i'd be uh, i'd be frightened i'm pretty <laughs> sure i would yes so, so yeah and you know and but there's so many kind of similarities to all of the accounts and then there's one of the accounts where it could actually be sasquatch bigfoot type thing that the guy's seen hmm. but believe it or not it's only seven miles from where the lads in broxa saw had their encounter, which we've just spoken about, and that was at a place called State yeah. near Cropton Forest. Yeah. And uh, whatever it was, it came to the window to observe him. But what I find fascinating, Paul, is that the the, the more than animal, in my opinion, the more than animal. The, you know, jumping back to Broxa, mm. when this thing appeared, witness three said to the other two, "It doesn't want you here. It wants you to go." And he looked at Steve and he said, Steve's surname, and you. And he said, I don't want you here, Jim. It wants you to go. Now, that tells me, well, the, the, the guys hadn't picked up on it. And uh, probably because they're not looking for things like that. And I, and I might be wrong, but that tells me that they, that, that were communicating with him. Yeah. And he said, when it did go, because it watched them all night. And for, I mean, st- in the end, Steve said he didn't even look at it. Yeah. He said, I just, I just wanted it to be over. Hmm. I don't, don't care how it ended. He said, but when it did go and they were packed up and they were leaving forest at first light, he's saying to them, it's still here. It's still watching us. And then they got to a certain place in forest. He said, it's gone now. You know, we're all right now. It's gone. Hmm. How did he know? You yeah. know, it's, yeah. it's fascinating. Yeah. There are a few things about it that are just really odd. Paul, because, I mean, one of the things that makes you take these lads seriously for me is the fact that I think, are they from around Rotherham area? They're, fr- they're from Rotherham, and, and I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, I mean, so that, that Steve were looking for answers. Yeah. I think that's why mo- most people who have had some kind of traumatic experience, and uh, it doesn't just have to be cryptid or unexplained phenomena related, it, just a tr- traumatic experience. We're looking yeah. for answers. We're looking for some kind of... Uh, solution to what's happened or some kind of justice to what's happened if it's a crime but the point is these guys had had this traumatic experience and it had really affected them it was 2018 that it had happened so steve was looking on internet found me we exchanged a few messages at first he kept showing up on live streams to be honest with you said he'd seen something and I'd, I'd, i'd kind of reached out to him exchanged a few messages took ages to get him on phone when we did get on phone, and I don't think he'll mind me saying, he he broke down in tears. Yeah. And uh, oh yeah, he, 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 because he said there were no, he said apart from Jim, there were nobody could talk to about it. Yeah. Nobody. Mm. And and Jim made the mistake of telling people, uh, you know, and a full respect to Jim, but he he, he received uh, uh, quite a bit of abuse or, or ridicule for it. Yeah. And now imagine him saying something to somebody in confidence or to friends yeah. and them not believing you, but not only not believing you, but ridiculing you. I'm, I'm not saying that's exactly what happened, but can you imagine something traumatic and having, and then, then people treating it as a, a, just as a joke? Yeah. So where are we going with this? So anyway, he reached out to me and eventually I got to speak to Jim. Jim was quite reluctant to speak at first. Mm. And then they agreed to tell us 
to meet us and show us where it happened. Now, they finished work at about four o'clock and it's probably a two hour, two and a quarter hour drive up to North Yorkshire from Rotherham. Yep, at yeah, least, at yep. least. We met them in a car park called Reesty Bank Car Park. It's just a rough sort of clear car park which is on Egypt Forest. Yep. From from there, we we walked down a logging road, myself, Les Drake, Chris Wright, who's been... He's, who's been absolutely instrumental helping us with Wolf Lancers, Chris Wright. Without Chris, I don't think film would have been the same. Mm. So myself, Les and Chris Wright, we walked down. We we went down the in, into the ravine. Luckily, Chris knew a different way. Uh, it still took us a long time. It still took us best part of an hour to get down. Yep. But we didn't go down the the way that uh, Steve and Jim went down that night, where we had to go down on the backsides in some places. Yep. We still descended this 800-foot ravine. So we got down there basically just so they could show us where it happened and it were getting dark and we had to come out within 30 minutes uh les is so unfit and he'll not mind me saying this that when we got to the top he collapsed he was out of it we had to, had to hold his head and put water in his mouth and we're all looking at each other thinking we're gonna we're gonna need an ambulance yeah everybody carried everything up that he were carrying because we knew he didn't feel too good yeah and uh Lads stayed with us, but it's dark. But so what am I saying? These guys travelled from Rotherham straight from work yep. just to show us where they saw this thing, jumped back in their cars. By this time, it's about nine o'clock at night, drove home, would have got back after midnight hmm. and started work next day. Yeah. Uh, somebody who's trying to spin you some kind of line does not go to that much effort to do that. Yeah. And the, subsequently then we've spent nights in the forest with them as well. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, I wish we'd have filmed Les, by the way. It would have been a bit of drama for Wolfland. But unfortunately we didn't. Hey, you know, listen to this, people. We're, in, we're, in, we're walking around Cropton Forest and there's uh, kind of little ruts and, and streams and, and I'm looking at, I'm walking along and I can just see water and grass f sort of floating in it. And it's only literally 18 inch deep. And I trod in it and went straight up to my waist. And, and Les didn't get it on film. He's got me shouting as I'm holding <laughs> camera up in air, straight up to my waist. Yeah, and the gamekeeper's laughing his head off, you know. So, yes, yeah, so, so we've, we've had some... Some fun whilst making Wolflands as well, in, in, so, and with plenty of ticks as well. There's loads of ticks in them forests. Yeah. That's unexplained phenomenon of people, but uh, it's unexplained how they managed to get on you. Oh, no, no, but, no, no. Yeah. I mean, so, that's why I was really intrigued by these lads, Paul, because obviously I know how long it takes, because it's only next door to where I live, Rotherham. So I know yeah, how, yeah. how far and how long it takes to get there and back. For them to have, as you say... It would have been very easy for, for Steve just to have left it at emails or a conversation. But I know you mentioned it right at the beginning when you're on about people getting in touch with you and you not being a counsellor. But I think you've hit on a really good point there when you're talking about Stephen and his maid. They'd got nobody to talk to who would, who would take them seriously at all. Nobody. That's correct. And that's probably why... Steve brought down when you spoke to him because it probably the relief of being able to unburden himself to somebody else, Paul, who wouldn't laugh in his face or tell him that he was hallucinating or it was somebody pulling his leg. Because this is the other thing, the the area they are, this is the thing when they go about, oh, well, it was just somebody having a laugh, mucking about. You've got to, you've got to take, if you take that as an explanation, you've got to then consider that somebody is wandering around a remote ravine in the middle of the night on the off chance that somebody turns up to do wild camping, which is nonsensical as an explanation, Paul. Absolutely, and they've got to be well in between seven and eight foot tall, yeah. and they've got to be built like like t t two men, yeah. covered in fur, and stand there all night looking at them. Mm. It just literally stood in a stance that they said it was like one of them American footballers that's just about to charge. Yeah, uh, absolutely terrified them, and. Yeah, I think you're right. And I think it's just, I don't try and offer people advice. I, I, I'll listen. I can only advise if I've experienced it myself. And a lot of things that happen, these are unique experiences to the person involved. Mm. There's tons of experts out there, Paul, as you know, and they're all willing to tell you what a thing is and tell you how you should have reacted. But each time the unexplained phenomena presents, 
you're like a rabbit in headlights. I'll, I'll tell you that for certain. Uh, I, now I'm telling people, <laughs> but it's true. <laughs> yeah. it, you know, as as a, as a child, when when I were experiencing these, what I've called the night people, these strange visitations, and there's not loads and loads of them, people, there's, but, but it happened. As a little boy, I were all, I laid there all night, probably not because I fell asleep, but I laid there as long as I could. And I thought, if it happens, I'm going to be ready. I'm going to be awake. I'm going to see him. I'm going to. Yeah. And do you know, it, it were only after it had happened that you, you that you realized it and it, it had finished yeah. that you realized that you'd been involved in it because you literally just trapped in mm. the moment. Yeah. You're never ready ever, ever. I never was anyway. Some people might be, but I never was. Mm, definitely. I think it's when you speak to, I mean, the, the other, one of the other great, like, as we were saying about the people that, you know, some of these witnesses have been very happy to come forward and speak to you about what happened to him. But I think, is it is it Jeff who's the gamekeeper, Paul? That's correct. Well, he's not now, but he was then, yeah. back in the day, yeah. I mean, he, he had a couple of things. So forgive me if I might have got my me, me stories confused, but did he have an incident with a ball of light? Before That's he correct. ended up, before he ended up seeing what everybody else, or similar to what other people are reporting. So he's once again, we've got this strange connection. But I know he's another one. I mean, when you see him on film, he's a big old unit. Is Jeff? He's, he's an imposing guy. He was twenty-one stone when we met him. Yeah. And uh, yeah, he's, he's he's carrying a bit of weight around his waist. Uh, I'm being kind to Jeff because he might pick me up and throw me away. But, yeah, <laughs> but what I'm saying is he's, he's got huge shoulders. Yeah. You look at one of Jeff's hands and look at his fingers, and one finger's as fat as two of mine. Yeah, and yeah. that's not fat. That's that's proper sort of hard-working hands. Hands like so, yeah, shovels, Paul. Absolutely. <laughs> and, you know, he's, he's a no-nonsense guy. I really, I really like Jeff. I, I yeah. like all the witnesses. So, yeah, Jeff, it was back in 2002, and he'd... In his words, he'd gone a bit feral. He was working as a gamekeeper, mm. and he'd been working there a few years, walked into a different part of the forest. He said, literally, off one of the logging roads that they always worked, but he said, you don't go off the paths unless you've a reason to. Yeah. And he says, and obviously this particular day, he must have gone in for something and came into a clearing, and there's, there's a farmhouse, yeah. an abandoned farmhouse. It had been abandoned since 1956. Mm. He says, and I walked, he says, the doors are just swinging open. He said, there's pine trees right up to the right hand and left hand side and the tight up to the back and the front had got a, something like a 30, 35 foot area of not, I wouldn't say grass, just rough scrubland. Mm. It went, well, and, and these channels were bits of watering because it was one of them that I went down into. Yeah. And um, he said, I thought, well, I'm sleeping in a caravan at the moment and I can make this my home. I can make this my base while I'm working here. There are well. He said, there's a fire in it. All yeah. windows had glass in. Yeah. And uh, no curtains or anything. He says, there were a table. Uh, there were like an old steel type bed frame uh, in it. Uh, it. Now, it had been abandoned since 1956, but I think in between that time, I think a school, well, I know because I did a bit of research and tried to contact people. A school in Sheffield had been taking children up on camping trips. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What, what, what I find fascinating is there's a, there's a comment. Well, I'll jump to Jeff in a moment, Paul, but there's a comment on, as I was trying to. I, I put what I were after. I put anything unusual happened. I didn't go into detail, and I joined the site. But and I were reading the comments, and somebody said, "Can you remember going to the outside toilet and seeing them them big eyes looking at you at night?" And I thought, oh, "Oh Christ, I wonder." Yeah, yeah, and that were there. And but you see, the comment were probably eleven years old. Yeah. Uh, and I couldn't get to the people. I, I I I did try, and you never know. Somebody might read it just on off chance and get back to me eventually, yeah. because I think the teachers of the who were present at the time said it were a sheep. And as Jeff said, you'd never get sheep going into forest because they're pretty. <sighs> they're not that the smartest of animals, and there's there's sort of little low lying branches everywhere surrounding that farmhouse. Yeah. They, they, they wouldn't be able to pass through it if yeah. one snagged its fur on its wool on something. It'd just stand there. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yep. So where are we going with it? So um, he said this particular night, his cousin had come to stay with him for a few days. He were going to go home that next day, hmm. and they were walking back along the logging road. And it had been between 10 and 11 at night. And suddenly a sphere of light just shot up from the side of him, literally into the air, baseball-sized white light. Now, he'd, he'd spent 
time in Marines and he thought it were a tripwire flare. Yeah. And he he says, I immediately dropped his cousin to the floor, Danny, they call his cousin, and he expected it to, you know, explode into light above him and squaddies to come out at Forest because we're only three miles away from area Filingdales or thereabouts and, uh, you know, the early warning st- station. So yeah. nothing happened. He said, and I looked round for any scorch marks or burns, there's nothing. He said, and then the next day I came and we had a look. There's nothing, in Jeff's words, nout. Yeah. There was nout. <laughs> so so uh, we about the subtitle all film, you know, and it's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's not just for Jeff, you know, yeah. for me as well. You know, I yeah. mean, Broad Yorkshire, you talk, and people just don't understand some of the things I'm saying. No, that's so, true. So yeah. where are we going? So uh, the, the Danny went home. He said, and after that... He said, wherever I went, I felt like I was being watched. Mm. So he said, I'd not felt it before. He said, and it, I'd be chopping wood outside farmhouse. It were almost as though there's somebody right on my shoulder. And I could hear this chatter, this language, this words. And I couldn't understand it. Radio chatter. He said, it was strange. And then himself and another gamekeeper heard a baby crying in the forest. Mm. So they walked towards where they perceived it. These these infants' cries and it stopped. He said we went in forest a bit, and he started deeper in forest. And so there's there's this like unnerving element, this this kind of build up, this the sphere of light, then this the, these other elements, and then on the on the night that it happened, it happened over two, you can say three nights if we include the sphere of light. Yeah. He, he said I'm laid there. I've lit a fire. I've barricaded the back door up. I've bolted the front door because that had a bolt on it. Yeah. No curtains. You know, this thing's been derelict a lot of years. It says, and I've made a fire, had something to eat, got in my sleeping bag. And I said, I'm laid there. It says, and I don't know why I woke up. He says, but I woke up. Don't know time, but it's early hours. And he's facing the window with his feet to the fire. He said, and there's literally just glowing embers. So he doesn't even know if he could, it could be it could be seen in the in the in the on the floor, you know, if anybody looking in through a window. Yeah. So this this thing just slowly its shape just appeared at window. He said, and I can see these huge shoulders, I can see this head that's looking down, it's ducking down below the window lintel. So it's yeah. taller than the window. Yeah. He said it's massive and it in, in in Jeff's words, he's thinking he said I'm thinking, what am I gonna do? Mm. I, 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 I'm zipped up in sleeping bag. He says and if I if I weren't what could I do? I could, uh, and uh, so the, I don't know. An amount of time passed, and it, it left, and it, it sort of went back into the forest. We assume. Well, the following night, Jeff put a tarp down on the ground, a tarp, you know, a polythene sheet, and got under the pine trees, which were about thirty to forty feet away from the front of the property, yep. and waited. And as he's waiting in the early hours, it comes out of the forest. He said, but there's another interesting aspect that kind of takes this away from the physical, the totally physical creature. He said it didn't walk, it arrived. Yeah. He said that his head was above the, the fascia board. Now, when, if you look at the, when you, anybody watching Wolflands will see, because we've filmed the fascia as he's talking about this, yep. and the tile line. These are on the lower buildings, the lower barns. So we're looking at seven to eight feet, and it stood at the window looking in. He says, I packed a sleeping bag with clothes inside as though it's me. He said, so I'm watching it, watching me inside. He said, but then I became aware that it knew exactly where I was, even though it was doing that. Mm. He said, either that or there's another one watching me somewhere behind him. He said, he said I just knew. So amount of time passed, he said, and it turned and it, it entered the, went down the farmhouse and entered the forest the way it came. He says, I didn't see any leg movement. He said, I, I could, all I saw were these huge shoulders and head and this black mass below it. So, but I didn't see any head movement. Mm. And, uh, I, I don't know. I, I don't know how much time elapsed before he went back into the farmhouse. He went round the back. He says, and his biggest worry, what it, was it inside when he yeah. got back inside? He says, nah, I spent a terrible night. Uneasy, he said. And the next day, I left. Hmm. That was it. I've done. And uh, he, he didn't say it frightened him to death, Jeff. He just said that. But obviously, it's had an effect on him. Let's put it that way. Hmm. But the move, the movement's fascinating, Paul. If we if we travelled probably five to six miles from that location, maybe 
seven, I'm not certain, mm. we'd come to Harwood Dale, another forest. Yeah. Because all these forests are linked, Paul, but they're only linked by name. Yeah. There's roads run through them, but, but basically it's just different locations. Everything's, everything's kind of linked and you can just go to one, from one to the other. Yeah. So this, this isn't in Wolflands, but it's three mountain bikers sort of going through Harwood Dale, coming down a logging road and becoming aware of what they said looked like a giant gorilla crossed with a bear that were upright parallel in them as they're going down logging road. And as I've just explained, there's bracken, fallen trees and these big divots, these big ruts are, are all over the place in these forests and giant boulders. And they said it were almost like it were on a sliding track. Yeah. We're, we're going hell for leather down this track trying, and we're looking at it and asking each other what we think it is. But it's just keeping up with them. And there's no movement of arms. There's no movement of legs. It's just like it's on a track. Mm. I mean, there's, there's so many attributes that take these things away from the true physical animal, uh, you know, flesh, blood, and, and nothing more. And I haven't got an answer to what exactly they are, but they are something different, without a doubt. Definitely. And I think the thing about that particular area at Country, Paul, is that, I mean, until I'd gone up to, to Durham, a few years ago, I was not aware of just how remote it is when you get up onto North Yorkshire Moors, like you've mentioned yeah. there, because you can see Filingdale's from miles away, because there's nothing else there. There um, isn't, no. And you've just got woods and, and the forest that you've mentioned, and then there's nothing, because anybody up there, everybody lives out towards the coast or on the coastline, whereas you only have to come back in, so at 10, 15 miles, Paul, and there's nothing. It's just moors. It, it, that's correct, you know, and uh, one of our witnesses had his experience we'll call it an experience because he didn't actually see anything at a place called Scalby Mills on top of the cliffs yes and and uh, I mean this thing whatever it was he said it, it, it were impacting earth as it were running towards him and he just dropped into a fetal position and abs in his words it absolutely terrified him uh, interestingly years before I've got rock anglers down, because you, when you stood on top of Scalby Mills, you've got fabulous views up the coast and down towards Scarborough. It's a ridge of uh, an outcrop of cliff. Hmm. And uh, you can look down into what's called Jackson's Bay. Yeah. So uh, during the course of writing the Truth Proof books, Paul, I've got UFO reports from anglers fishing in Jackson's Bay. I've got a huge... This guy didn't know whether it were a cat or a dog. Yeah. He, he just was he beach fishing on his own during the night. Uh, he did give me a date, and, I'm, and someone tells me it was 2011. Uh, they call him Mally Skelton. Uh, so I'm assuming it's Malcolm Skelton. And yep. uh, he was happy enough for me to use his name. He even did me a drawing. He said, I'm fishing. He said, and I just got this awful feeling that I was being watched. He said, I turned around with my headlamp on. As he touched on before, that all these fishermen have headlamps, and they're usually pretty good. That's why you can see it beam on water, yeah. you know, from over the cliffs. He said, and I scanned these cliffs. And the cliffs at Scalby Mills aren't like Speeton and, and Bempton. These are dirty clay cliffs that just kind of run down to the beach, and they're not mm. as steep. Mm. He says, and there's, running along the cliff, or move, just sauntering along the cliff, is a huge animal on four legs. He says, it's got the, it looks like a dog, a huge dog, a uh, slight curve in its back. It's got a great big long tail like a big cat, but it looks like a dog. And it's, it's just just sauntering along bottom of the cliff. Mm -hmm. And it, it, I think he said it looked at him once, you know, caught its gaze once in lights. And then the path that he'd come down to get onto the beach, he said it literally, he said it took me five minutes to get down. It went up there in seconds. Mm -hmm. He says, now we're a bit frightened having to go back up. But we're not that far from population. We're not from populated areas. And he, this guy's seen that. Mm -hmm. But where am I going? So we've... If we if we go from Scalby Mills, we then go to East Ayton, where folklore tells of the bar guest of East Ayton, you know, a, a yeah. huge phantom hound with f these fabulous glowing eyes that said to haunt the forests and moors of the area. And the guy who wrote about that wrote about it 120 years ago, and I found it in an archive in Bridlington, and he was called Howard Brearley. Mm. So he's probably looking at accounts that are well before that. Do you, do you know what I mean? Yeah. He wouldn't have been writing in present day. I would have thought he'd have been going into the annals of folklore that he knew of 120 years ago. So it's, so you got from East Eight and you go to Hackness. And Hackness is fabulous because it's, it used to have a monastery and it, it's got a saint, St. Hilda uh, of, of Whitby, who founded the monastery and, and uh, 
at Achnes, and there's a nun called, I'll always get this wrong, I think they're called a Begu, who had the vision. She had a vision and saw St. Hilda being carried to heaven and all sorts of things. They're all documented by the, uh, the, the you know, the bead yeah. and the ancient bead. And, and uh, it's, it, I mean, we know stories get distorted and changed over time. You know, things added to, taken away to fit the narrative of what somebody wants people to believe. But there's usually an element of truth, you know, and we'll talk about Howard Braley and he's not really talking about anything different to what we're looking into today. Yeah. And, you know, and, and it, so it's fascinating. And it, Hackness in ancient times used to be called Hachanos, mm. which, and why they called it that, I don't know, but it, it literally means with the whiskers, mm. uh, so, which is fascinating. And Brock's a forest. Which I think I might have touched on it before with you, Paul. In some cultures, the Broxer is a shape-shifting demon. Yeah. So where these guys saw this thing in Broxer Forest, but then you've got all these other things attributed to it. To, I mean, I got the most incredible story a few weeks ago. I'd forgot about this, to be honest. Fascinating, more than terrifying. There's a guy driving home from his parents' house, and he decides to drive through Hackness. I hope I've made a, a folder for this report, because uh, I've not really written it up. Uh, I've copied and pasted what he told me, and that's what I do. I make a folder, and then I write my observations. Yeah. So he said he just rounds a corner, and as he rounds the corner, he said, he's presented the, from right to left of the road a huge what He said it looked like a cobweb. He said, but it was huge, and it was glowing white. And he said the strands were as thick as uh, washing line. Mm. He said, but this thing, there's no trees above or anything. It's just hanging in the air. Yeah. There's nothing there. And it's as wide as the road. He says, and when I hit it with my car, it just turned to mist and the car filled with a sweet smell. Oh. So, uh, uh, so, you know, a, a little events like that little yeah. short stories because i've never heard anything like it and i find that fascinating yeah but but there's a lot jumping back to wolf fans there's a lot of stories paul that have not made it to wolf fans that have been just as good we've got two guys on mopeds who'd stopped very close to hackness for cigarette and claimed that this thing and we, we we knew about this story, by the way, but, so they've not told us it because they wanted to be in this documentary. Mm -hmm. We knew about this bef long before we were going to do Wolflands. Literally parted the hedgerow and looked through and looked at them, this huge bipedal creature. Needless to say, they were terrified. Yeah. So, it, so it's fascinating, but it, it's all the ingredients are there. It, you know, it's just app on about the words, multi-phenomena. Yeah. It's, it's all there. It is. But like you've just mentioned there, Paul, th these are not things that have only recently started to be reported, because I know one of the other places I've been up there is Gothland, which is obviously just outside Whitby. But it's one of those places, most people around the UK will know it as, as where Heartbeat was filmed, the, That's the correct, TV show. Yeah. That, I mean, I've heard it described as a bracing moorland village, Paul. I think there's just over 400 people live there. And it's one of those that there's nothing around it 10 miles either way. It's beautiful. And round there, they had legends of, of shucks, giant black dogs running across the, the moors. That's correct. Huge dogs with flaming eyes, as big as saucers, glowing eyes. But not only have they got that at Gothland, and Gothland's within sight of the farmhouse where the gamekeeper used to use as, as his base. Yeah. You can see Gothland from it. Now, incidentally, since we've been there, they've deforested a lot of it. Hmm. And I don't think it's because of us or anything silly yeah, like that, yeah. but uh, they've deforested a lot of it. But right, where are we going with Golfland? Golfland's got the legend of the guy trash, yeah. which, once again, I don't know if you've heard of it, but it's a huge bipedal hound or a huge phantom hound yeah. that's supposed to haunt an area around a place called Julian Park. Mm. Now, it's not, there's no fancy park at Golfland. It was just called Julian Park. And there's also taught that the, the guy trash was the inspiration for Conan Doyle's Hound of the Baskervilles, mm. which is interesting. And, 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 and I'm going to get this wrong, people, because I've not really researched in great detail, but I think it was Jane Eyre yep. about the guy trash. Yep, yep, and, yep, yep. And, and, and she believed she'd actually seen it. So although she wrote these, these wonderful novels, she actually believed she'd seen the guy trash. And when we come to Whitby, we've got the stories of the phantom hounds with huge glowing eyes. And we people, not me, people believe that the inspiration for the Hound of Dracula 
has mm-hmm. come from Whitby mm-hmm. with the, with the phantom hounds and the black dog law, the folklore of the area. Yeah. So all the ingredients, Paul, are there. Yeah. I've, said, I've said it many times. I'm just treading in other people's footsteps and, and bringing this subject and bringing these things back to life. Mm-hmm. They've never gone away. Yeah. I mean, it is, it's one of those things. And, and, and same as you, Paul, I love to dig into things and find out. And there's so many places around there that have just got... When you look at the names, people will just go, oh, well, it's called that for that reason. But then when you dig into it, there's so many that are from the Vikings, when the Vikings came over and they're basically been in- anglicised into into different things. But obviously they, there's a lot of reference to animals and wolves and creatures. Every, uh, there's tons and absolutely loads of references to the wolf mm. and, and you know I've all, i'm always clean keen to stress you know we, the, the wolf would have been sort of uh, very prolific around those parts back back then but you know close to where the guys had their experience in broxa that we've just talked about is a place called war's man's head yeah and uh you you think to yourself, well, what, what, what's he? Where's, what's this? War's man's head. So, in Viking terminology, Norse, the warg was the wolf. So, if we replace the R with a G, it would become wolf man's head, and that, that's very close to where they had their experience. You, you, you know, you've got you've got Howl Moor, you, you, you've got. Uh, Blaworth, which means uh, uh, running wolves, you know, Blaworth Beck, and uh, you, you've uh, Hounddale, you've got all sorts. Then you've got, you just out of Flixton, you've got Hundmanby. Mm. And so you're thinking, what, what does that one mean? So it's Hund, Hound, Houndman. Farmstead of the Houndman. It literally means Farmstead of the Houndman. Uh, I haven't bent it to, to say it means Farmstead of the Houndman people. That's what it means. Uh, that, now there's talk of that's they don't actually know why it's being called that so people have uh suspect that it's because the king kept his hounds there but there's no record of the king ever keeping hounds at hunbamboo yeah uh and once again is that just somebody rationally thinking well there's got to be a reason for it and perhaps it's because the king kept his hounds there i don't know uh Logic says that there's a more earthly explanation than something like a bipedal fur-covered creature that's terrorising people. Hmm. But back through the annals of time, we've got all these reports of exactly that. Hmm. You know, even even to even to the shamanistic people, the the inhabitants of Flixton Star Car, which hmm. we, the, you know the, the Britain's first. Oldest, the, the oldest house ever found is in Flixton, which yeah. is interesting, you know. Uh, so, and they believe that the people at Flixton stopped being hunter gatherers and settled around what would have been, they wouldn't have known it as Lake Flixton, but that's what the archaeologists have called it. Mm. And now it's a huge dried up bed of fertile ground, you know, mm. the sediment could probably sub- sustain lush grass forever. Yeah. But, uh, and uh, the archaeologists speculate that the people, the early settlers of Flixton Star Car, yeah. were shaman, practicing ritualistic magic and sacrifice, because they found ed- evidence of mass animal butchery and sacrifice there, yeah. uh, or, or, or things that lead lead people to believe that there's been sacrificial mm. uh, occurrences there, should we say. And what do we get coming out of Flixton? Stories of this huge bipedal hound, and they're coming out to present day just about. Yeah. And yeah, I, I, I wish I'd got an answer to it, but, but I mean, we, we talk about shaman, and we're looking at other parts of the world and other cultures, and th- there's people that believe that they transform into the beast. Yeah. You know, transform not just to the wolf, to the leopard. You know, the, you, there's the leopard men of Sierra Leone. Yeah. If you look back through the annals of time, there were the crocodile men. Yeah. And, you know, the people that they had to do something really, really d- dark and, and oh, God, some terrible crime. Yeah. Usually against a loved one. And, and that gave them the ability to make the, a pact with the darker side. Mm. And, and, for that well they were able to transform i could go into detail with that but it's a bit macabre and i won't yes so there you go yeah i mean well it is i mean there are cultures all around the world as you say there paul i mean all across europe there's people who have, have had this so even even you know obviously people know about were werewolves and and the legends surrounding them from europe but obviously there were people that believed that 
there were weir cats as yeah. well. So it's it's not just it, it's not just a modern thing. Wherever you go around the world, there will have been cultures that had some kind of animalistic belief system that people could transform into creatures of all varieties of shapes and sizes. And it seems that in certain parts of the world, it still continues regardless. Yeah. Well, yeah, and let's not forget, Paul, that, that these beliefs uh, go back so far, long before we sort of crossed continents and went to other parts of the world to glean this knowledge and then spread these stories. The, the, the stories of a similar nature were present in all of these places all around the world before mm -hmm. this cross-pollination of knowledge. Yeah. So. So, so that's fascinating in itself, you know, and just, just before we leave, um, th what, what we talked about Warsman's head in the same location within half a mile of where Warsman's head is, which we, which I've, I've bent those words, people, because I, I realized the warg was then the, the Norse for wolf. Or, yeah. So, uh, you know, replacing the, uh, the, the S for an R turns it into Wolfman's head. But there's also a place called Moor Rig. Mm. Which it, and and the moor is spelled M A W and the moor is often associated with the gaping jaws of Fenrir, the Viking hound, which was in Viking legend in in the Viking end of the world Ragnarok was said to kill Odin. Yeah. And you know these these stories are probably as well as old as the, I'm not going to say as old as the Bible because I haven't got that knowledge to say it, but these stories go back many many years you know more than hundreds of years and uh, it's fascinating there's grains of truth in everything absolutely absolutely i suppose as well the temptation with wolflands you know as you were joking about people saying when's it coming out when's it coming out i suppose twofold paul it's one of those that i know when you started it you 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 would get in reports as it was going so it was probably it's probably been hard to draw a line and say right we've done now we've done this because it, I would imagine the temptation is that, as with anything, Paul, you'll get a brilliant report or a brilliant witness and you'll think, oh, if only I'd spoke to him three months ago. Yeah, that's correct. You know, uh, there's a, I've, we've got a few now <laughs> and uh, the, the, obviously they can't go in. We've got, I think there's eight witnesses in Wolflands mm. and, you know, they're all diverse, all un, unconnected to one another. But, yeah, we've got a few now. And once Wolfland's done, I would have thought, later this month and we've not got much more into the month where are we oh 13th back end of this month i'll be starting some work with chris turner mm. and we, 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 we've got a few projects to do and and i won't just be saying goodbye to les by the way uh we, we've spent three years on this and we've had some really good arguments in that three years i'll tell you now people but uh, <laughs> <laughs> just, <laughs> but no but the, but the point i'm getting at is uh we will be doing something else mm. uh it's just I, I want to do a long-term project with Les and uh, the, the plans that I've got with Chris, we're, we're reviving a documentary that we were going to do uh, a few years ago, mm. uh, which probably get renamed, but it was called Super Liminal. Yeah. And uh, we sh you know, we're going to start some new projects. I'm, I'm looking forward to it. It's, it's, it's a strange one, Paul, you know, a, I was 16 November and you, you don't and you never think you're going to get to that kind of age you know when you're in your 30s it's weird and yeah. I don't mean I didn't think I'd live that long you yeah. just never see it coming no. but um, but I'm doing something and I'm I'm out all of the time and sort of full on with this all of the time and I absolutely love it you know it, it does have its I think the most frustrating element of doing this kind of work this kind of research is the fact that the information never comes fast enough yeah uh, you know and you never actually get an answer to what you're looking at mm. or, or what you're looking into, should I say, but it's, I find it really worthwhile. And, uh, uh, witness is key to me. The witness is, is, is the absolute, uh, king, should I say, when I'm talking to people, it's, it's not about me. It's mm. about the people who are telling the accounts. That's why when we do the live stream and you're much the same, I think you allow the, per the, the, the speaker, the person you're speaking to, to, to kind of get on with the job for most of it. Yeah. Because, I've, I've, well, I've noted on a lot of live streams, there's a lot of the hosts, should we say, just uh, if, if we've got an hour of a live stream, I, I would have thought 20 minutes of it is the host yeah. talking. But uh, you don't get that from me, and I don't think we get it from you, Paul. No, no, absolutely. I'm just the conductor, Paul. Everybody else plays the, the tune. Yeah, yeah, all good then. <laughs> so then, Paul, as always, I mean, obviously the film will be out sooner rather than later but i know we're just you're just trying to find out how to get it positioned and everything so 
For anybody else, where can they follow your work, catch your regular live streams, which are always highly recommended, um, and, and get hold of books and, and find your website, my friend? Yeah, well, the website is truthproof.uk, and the paperbacks are available on, on the website. And, uh, you know, if, if, you, if anybody purchased a book and they, they want it, anything nice put it inside it, just give me a shout. I'll do that. Uh, uh, yeah, you've no need to worry about it being signed because I don't know if anybody else does this. I'm probably the only fool in the world that does. But I sign every book. Every book I send out, I sign. Uh, I, I, it's not too hard. It's no big stress, and I don't mind doing it. So so they're on website. And they're also on eBay. They used to be on Amazon, but it, it just d- d- become unviable. Yep. Uh, the, but the Kindles are on Amazon, and I will be allowing Amazon to print and publish and print the books. Uh at some point this year, yeah. uh, when I said they were unviable before, we were we were publishing the books and printing them, and the the, the hoops that we had to jump through it, it were just too it were difficult. Yeah. So yeah, so that's the website. The film I've I've been banging on for the last three years about it, and we've been saying we're nearly there, we're nearly there. Well, as far as Paul and Les are concerned, we finished filming. It's just in the process of the music now, and uh, having the music added, which will, which will be quite special because. Uh, it's, it's bespoke. I, me, green as grass, I thought it was just a matter of just laying some music over a film. Mm. But th- th- every element of the film, as uh, every part of it, every person who's participated, have, have got this, a slightly different version of the same music. It's, it's really smart how they're doing it. Yeah. So uh, that's about where we're at, Paul. I can't think of anything else I could add to that, apart from it's been a pleasure talking to you. And anybody that's stood the course long enough to listen to me rambling on today, people, I'm sorry if I were a bit disjointed, but... <laughs> just... <laughs> Don't worry about it, my friend. You're always good value. It's always a pleasure speaking with you, finding out what's going on. Love keeping up with your work. Hopefully I'll uh, I'll get out to your neck of the woods again soon this year. Come You're and uh, spend a bit more time with her, if that's all right, my friend. And uh, always, I eagerly await the full version of Wolflands because obviously I know you did it on your on your live stream the other week. You you put a lovely fifteen minute sort of trailer for it, or an extended highlight reel for us all to to whet the appetite. So, and I wish you the very best to look with it because it looked brilliant. And as always, my friend, it's lovely to speak with you. Paul, thank you. Been a pleasure.